everyone and thank you for joining us. And as you know, this is a panel. We have experts on domestic violence prevention, uh, uh, protection and prosecution. And we're going to begin with Dr. Simonovich, who's the special rapporteurs for violence against women. And I just want to introduce her. She was appointed as United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Violence Against Women, Its Causes and Consequences in June 2015. She started her venue uh, in 2015, and she was appointed by the Human Rights Council. Dr. Simonovich was a member of the CEDAW Committee between 2002 in 2014 and served as its chairperson in 2007 and 2008. Uh, she, uh, she was the chairperson of the optional protocol working group. In 2006 and 7, she was chair and vice chair of the Council of Europe's task force to combat violence against women including domestic violence that proposed the adoption of the Council of Europe Convention on Violence Against Women. Between 2008 and 2010, she co-chaired the ad hoc committee that elaborated the Convention on Prevention and Combating Violence, uh, known as the Istanbul Convention. For a number of years, she headed the Human Rights Department at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Croatia and was posted as the Minister at the Permanent Mission of Croatia to the United Nations. She was also the Ambassador uh, to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe and the United uh, Nations in Austria. She was Chairperson of the UN Commission on the Status of Women and also worked as a member of the UNIFEM Consultant Committee. Wow, a lot of experience. Uh, can I ask you, uh, can you give us an overview of the Istanbul Convention uh, on preventing violence against women and domestic violence? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction and thank you for inviting me to participate in this webinar and share my assessment and reflections on the domestic violence, prevention, protection and prosecution internationally and domestically from perspective of my mandate, this special report on violence against women, its causes and consequences. What means that I will address uh, the Istanbul Convention, but also international framework uh, in general related to violence against women, just to show um, what are key points with respect to domestic violence as a term, domestic violence against women and violence against women, because now we are using different terminology and clarifications are needed in order to see what is the scope under which instrument and how we have developed those definitions. So my mandate was established, for example, in 94, in order to send a clear message that violence against women is a human rights violation. And I'm using United Nations human rights framework, starting from Universal Declaration on Human Rights, but also focusing on CEDO Convention as the most comprehensive international women's human rights instrument on elimination of discrimination against women, but also on violence against women. This is not seen sufficiently since violence against women is not explicitly mentioned in the CEDO Convention, but through the work of CEDO Committee and elaboration of the interpretation of the Convention, it was clarified that violence against women is form of discrimination against women and is falling under Article 1 of the CEDO Convention. 
So um, it was already mentioned that I co-chaired the working group that elaborated the Istanbul Convention. Istanbul Convention is this year celebrating its 10th anniversary, and it is Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence. So one part is violence against women addressing specifically women, but domestic violence is addressing all possible victims of domestic violence. Can you tell, uh, I'm sorry. Can you tell us the broad definition of domestic violence? Yes. Thank you. Yes, I'm coming to that point. So um, if we look at definitions that we have at international level, we can see that in a declaration on the elimination of uh, violence against women, there is definition of violence against women. Then in CEDO general recommendation 19, there is also definition of violence against women. And this definition is more or less repeated now in the Istanbul Convention. Uh, but if we look now at Istanbul Convention, in addition to defining violence against women, and in Istanbul Convention, violence against women is defined as a violation of human rights and form of discrimination against women, and shall mean all acts of gender-based violence that result in or are likely to result in, in physical, sexual, psychological, or economic harm or suffering to women, including threats of such acts. So this definition is repeating what is already in declaration on elimination of violence against women at the UN level, but here it is legally binding. So this is the difference. All states that have ratified Istanbul Convention have this as a legally binding definition. But in addition to this definition, for the first time in international legally binding treaty, we have definition of domestic violence because CEDO is not defining domestic violence UN Declaration on Elimination of Violence Against Women is not defining domestic violence. They are referring to domestic violence. And for example, first mandate called uh, Ms. Radhika Kumaraswamy, who had my mandate in 96, she 1996, she produced at that time report on domestic violence and model law on domestic violence. So that term was used, but was not defined. And now, uh, Istanbul Convention is providing definition of domestic violence, uh, stating that it shall mean all acts of physical, sexual, psychological, or economic violence that occurs within the family or domestic unit, or between former or current spouses or partners, whether or not perpetrator shares or shared the same residency with the victim. So we will see that this is very broad definition. So what was added also uh, this um, uh, residency uh, issue because uh, it is not required for them to live together. So it is uh, all possible victims of domestic violence are included. And then there is also definition of what is uh, gender-based violence against women. So domestic violence could happen against all persons, but it is also specified that it predominantly affects women. And how we know that? Because it is required that all states collect data. Personally, as a special rapporteur on violence against women, I have launched femicide initiative, and I have called all states to have data on uh, intentional killings of women in category of intimate partner killings, family related killings and other killings. And those are objective categories because we link perpetrator and the victim. And in this context of domestic intimate partner killing, we are seeing that out of uh, 10 persons killed, 100% persons killed, all persons killed, more than 80% are women. So this is showing that prevention of domestic violence against women should be very important for all states and collection of data on intimate partner killings is very important indicator of level of such violence. Also a collection of data on, on family related killings. So for that reason, I think that Istanbul Convention is really very progressive instrument that in addition to definitions of violence against women and domestic violence is also giving definition of a due diligence during uh, 
elaboration of the convention, many delegations requested me at that time, I was co-chairing the drafting committee to uh, elaborate such definition because previous special reporters and uh, UN documents are using uh, state obligation to um, apply due diligence obligation, but it was not clearly explained. And now in Istanbul Convention, there is also definition there. So um, in addition to good definitions that should be incorporated at the national level, uh, because legislation is very important piece, implementation is also extremely important uh, to uh, track through collection of data. But let us also look into protection services, because if you look into protection services, protection services are also covered by CEDAW convention. You can see this from concluding observations sent to states that are reporting to CEDAW committee, from uh, jurisprudence of CEDAW committee and so on. But there is no specific article that is addressing helplines, that is addressing shelters, that is addressing protection orders. So advantage of Istanbul convention is there are specific articles on services and protection measures. So for example, there is specific article on helplines that should be available uh, seven days a week, 24 hours free of charge. There is specific article on, shelter, on shelters, article 23, that requires state parties to take all necessary measures to provide for setting up appropriate, easily accessible shelters in sufficient numbers. And as a special rapporteur, I have visited a number of countries, but in a uh, majority of them, there are no uh, sufficient number of shelters. They are not um, supported sufficiently by government. They are not seen as a human rights obligation. And I have also produced report on the shelters and protection orders. Then if you look at Istanbul Convention, there is specific article uh, 53 that is uh, regulating protection orders. This is also not new because in um, in CEDAW convention, there is no such detailed provision. There is in jurisprudence of the committee, but there is no in legally binding article. So here we can look at a uh, requirement for uh, availability of uh, protection orders, go orders, possibility to expel perpetrator from the house and so on. Um, in summary, I would like to conclude that Istanbul Convention is very compatible with CEDAW Convention. It is on a regional level and it is more detailed, but those obligations are also at the global level. Uh, and to find them, you need to look into concluding observations, general recommendations, and recently CEDAW also jointly with my mandate elaborated general recommendation 35 on gender-based violence against women in order to upgrade its previous general recommendation on violence against women and to put it in line with Istanbul Convention. So in, in summing up, the Istanbul Convention is a gold standard. It is uh, like vaccination against gender-based violence against women, but we are not using it sufficiently. We are not using sufficiently CEDO, we are not using sufficiently Istanbul Convention and other treaties. And Istanbul Convention could be used by all states as a, as a roadmap to, um, to um, model their national laws in this area. Um, I, if later on we will have time, I would also like to mention rape and my uh, next thematic report on rape and definitions that are in Istanbul Convention that should be followed up and so on. But here I would stop at this point because I think that I have used 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Rose, can we, since I started too early, can we go back to you and I'll introduce you again. Rose is the head of the Gender Monitoring Office in Rwanda. It's a government institution entrusted to contribute to ensure accountability of public, private, and civil society, as well as faith-based institution in implementing gender equality. Before joining this position with the government, she worked for more than 15 years with the UN in several countries in Africa and the United States. Ms. Rob Bahihi also has extensive working experience with research institutions and NGO. The main focus of her work has been to promote gender equality 
women's rights with specific focus on governance, peace, security, and violence against women. Uh, so let me ask you again, uh, can you share with us briefly? Oh, you're muted. Can you unmute yourself, Rose? There we go. Uh, can you share with us briefly Rhonda's vision in regard to gender equality and women's empowerment and how it impacts issues of domestic violence? Uh, thank you, uh, Elizabeth, for uh, organizing this uh, discussion and for that brief introduction. Um, uh, Rwanda's vision on uh, gender equality is uh, uh, articulated on the country's constitution, uh, which uh, positions gender equality very central of its provisions. Uh, it is very inclusive uh, and it is a fundamental principle uh, for us, it is a fundamental principle of good governance and of uh, sustainable development and human rights. Um, and as a result, it guarantees gender equality and women's rights. And uh, the country continues uh, to explore and to review legal instruments that can promote and further really promote the inclusion of, of women and, uh, and, and, and uh, fight against any discrimination. Very particularly, the, 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 the word discrimination comes very often in, in our constitution and uh, it has been a basis of a lot of uh, law reviews. Uh, in uh, addition, uh, our gender ecosystem uh, enjoys uh, mechanisms that have been established to uphold all aspects of gender inclusiveness, not only in development, but also in policies, lawmaking, uh, ensuring that there is really uh, no one who's left behind. That is why you see, for example, now the parliament that the space for women, space for uh, people living with disability, for the youth, it has been tried to be as inclusive uh, as possible. Uh, just here to clarify that um, for Rwanda, gender-based violence, including domestic uh, violence, are seen not only as social issues, but also at the same time, there are security concerns and there are good governance and sustainable development threat. Uh, that is why all the institutions have been tasked to ensure that they are inclusive and that harassment, gender-based violence, domestic violence, all are legally prohibited. And we have provision that are very, very um, strong on punishment, but we also have uh, instrument and mechanism that are supporting the prosecution, that are um, supporting investigation and the whole sector of justice. A, a very clear example is what we call here one-stop centers. All over the country, we have what we call um, um, one-stop centers that are very comprehensive uh, centers where you can find all the, 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 the support, all the services together. Because we had noticed that there is a problem for victims, especially for gender-based violence, because you are in the community and the community might not be very supportive. But when you go to those centers, you have the whole range of services you can get. You get the ego, you get the health, you get the reintegration, you had everything. It is free of charge. On top of it, because as you know, Rwanda has strongly pushed um, really women to be at the front of state of governance. You know that we have a parliament that, a parliament that is majority women. We have 61% of women in the parliament. We have 52 in the cabinet. We have 49 point something in the judiciary. All of this has supported uh, Rwanda to ensure that we have a very strong ecosystem to, to, to punish, to investigate, to prosecute. And those one-stop center are free of charge, but on top of it, they have 
they have a provision at source base that allows to give, for example, transportation uh, um, facilitation to victims because we know many women in the community might not have, you know what, when you are, you, you meet uh, your husband comes or any other person in the household and you, you, are, you, 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 you are raped or you have been, you are beaten, you, you try to flee, you don't go search for money for transportation. So resources are given to the victim so that they can't be um, limited by the mobility to go and report to the centers. And those centers have also rooms where you can live for a while and you can be supported to be able to, to come back to life. If you, you are a woman who's working, you can go back to your work. You can go back to your community if you want, but at least you are uh, supported. Another very important uh, thing that happened because of that ecosystem and the gender equality vision that we have is that when a woman is uh, a man or so, because you sometimes or so we will deceive men and women who have been uh, gone through violence in the home. So what is very important is that the prosecution is done automatically because when you go to the center, the rest, you don't have to go back again and forth. They continue the prosecution, they continue up to the court. You don't have to appear there and go and, and stand and defend yourself, it is done automatically. And uh, you have on top of this, the psycho uh, social trauma that is also the counseling that is in the package of what the victim receives. So that, that is grosso modo, but we have an, uh, other facilitation uh, that I can elaborate on if there is any question on that, Elizabeth. Thank you very much. And now we're going to Benita Myersfeld, who is a professor at the University Law School of Wits in Johannesburg. She's a human rights lawyer, an academic, and an advocate. She's an associate, for, I already said that. She was director of the Center for Applied Legal Studies at Wits. She's worked in various international NGOs and was a parliamentary legal advisor in the House of Lords in the United Kingdom. She was editor of the South African Journal on Human Rights and the founding member and chair of the Board of Lawyers Against Abuse. Uh, Benita obtained her LLB cum laude from Wits and her master's and doctors in law from Yale Law School. She teaches and publishes in the areas of international law, business and human rights women's rights and animal laws. She's the author of the book, Domestic Violence and International Law. Benita has consulted for and presented expert statements to various United Nations for. She's been appointed Chevalier de l'Ordre National de Merite, Knight of the National Order of Merit by the President of France in order of her work in human rights and gender-based violence. And now may I ask you questions. Uh, as you state in your book, domestic violence and international law, isn't domestic violence a violation of international human rights law? Thank you, Elizabeth. You know, I think Today, for many people, it's trite, it's obvious that any manifestation of violence against women, including domestic violence, constitutes a violation of international law. But that was not always the case. And in many respects, even though the narrative confirms that domestic violence is a violation of international law, the private nature of that violation, in fact, the private nature of all violations relating to gender-based violence, which is more often the case, seems to preclude the serious attention being given to the concept of a state's duty to take positive steps to ensure that non-state actors do not commit acts of gender-based violence, in particular domestic violence. And so, yes, the book at the time 
sought to ground what we all accept as a principle in specific principles of international law, linking both the development of international human rights law vis-a-vis -vis gender based violence, together with the principles of state responsibility for violations of inter or for the commission of international wrongful acts, uh, to confirm that actually if states don't take certain steps, if they refrain from implementing the principles contained in the miscellany of international instruments, if they do so, they will in fact not only be in violation of their obligations under international instruments vis-a-vis -vis women in their country, but they would in fact be in violation of their international obligations vis-a-vis -vis other states. And you know, it was really very interesting developing that thesis, that concept, because for a lot of people, uh, they, they were sort of broadly two antipoles. You know, on the one hand, they were feminist theorists, women's rights activists, and practitioners who would say, but of course, domestic violence is a violation of international human rights law. I mean, this is a, uh, a, a this speaks for itself. On the other hand, there were practitioners, experts, participants, academics in international law who recoiled at the idea that something so intimate and so private could constitute a violation of international law. And the book sought to, to address those two extremes and somehow bring them together in a way that was justifiable within the contours of international law. And the reality is that domestic violence, at least in my view, brings together the broad concept of gender equality and the right to be free from gender-based violence, together with very specific actions that states should be taking. And you know, Rose, you articulated the type of activities that are in place, the type of centers that are in place, the one-stop centers to address gender-based violence. But in keeping with that is, is the fact that gender-based violence is an enormously complex, complicated, and intellectually difficult factor to or phenomenon to understand and even more so to address. The, the book recommended a theory of lawyering domestic violence of how properly to address it and how a state, if it were to comply with its international obligations, ought to be responding to this uh, particular manifestation of of human rights violations. The premise of... Go ahead. Sorry, Elizabeth. Sure. The premise of the, the state obligation is that ready to talk about domestic violence or any form of gender-based violence from the perspective only of law and policy is deficient. Because inherent in domestic violence and gender-based violence, is the inextricable link between the trauma and the psychosocial impact of that trauma. And because of that trauma, we tend to see that the state responses, the legal responses to gender-based violence almost operate in parallel. So it's, it's I often described it as a highway, right? And in one direction, you have the laws and the mechanisms, the aspirations, the high level principles. And in the other direction, completely missing one another is the experience or the reality of those who survive uh, or don't survive gender-based violence. And one of the reasons is because gender-based violence is so particular, so peculiar, a violation of of social norms and standards and laws. Its impact is such that it makes the law almost completely inaccessible. The law almost misses entirely the harm that's in place. So for example, if you take the phenomenon of rape, we all know that a person who experiences rape physiologically often will shut down, her memory will shut down. They will be misguided, but real feelings of 
concern around her own implication in the violation that occurred. What could she have done differently? What did she do? And these are misplaced, but they're real. And if you look at that reality alongside the justice system in most democracies, the justice system says, you know, look at the veracity of the witness. Is she looking you in the eye? Is she clear on all the facts that occurred? Is she able to say on this day, on that time, this is what happened to me. This is the person or the people who did it to me. And the reality is that for a lot of people who experience rape, the inverse occurs. I don't want to look you in the eye because what I've experienced is so deeply traumatic. I don't remember everything that happened. I may remember a, a sight or a smell or a sound, but I don't remember exactly what time of day it is. It was. Now, to an unschooled adjudicator or a judge, they immediately presume that that lack of specificity means that the person is not telling the truth, but the opposite is in fact the case. The lack of specificity, the inability to look your accuser, uh, your, the, the accused in the, in the eye often is confirmation that what has happened to you is rape. And so when we talk about a state duty, the vacuousness of that concept for many state actors, notwithstanding, the population of those concepts by people like the special rapporteurs, by the miscellany of resolutions and, and directives coming out of international bodies, all saying these things. These are not terribly new points. But the duties of states remain vacuous. They think as long as they have a criminal procedure act, then they've criminalized rape and they've taken the necessary step. And yet that's far from the truth. And the fact that most states do not fund shelters. Now, I completely endorse what Dr. Simonovich has said. The fact that most states do not fund, create, run, demand, sustain shelters, shelters where you as a woman can come with your teenage son, if needs be, shelters that are going to be responsive to your workplace, your economic circumstances, for as long as they don't do that basic step, how can we possibly say that states are taking seriously their international obligations to prevent violence against women? To my mind, it's a vacuous non-compliance with those standards. Thank you very much, Bonita. And, uh, and I want to now introduce Sir John Warrior who is the Chief Strategy Officer for the Battered Women's Justice Project. She trains and provides technical assistance to, to professionals in various criminal justice systems. She's also served at the local, state, national, and international levels. She's a faculty member on the National Judicial Institute of the National Council of juvenile and family court judges. Sujata's work on international settings includes Iraq and Bangladesh, where she served as the country director. She also developed a national Egyptian strategy to address violence against women. Sujata recently served on the Federal Department of Justice's Office on Violence Against Women's Advisory Board after being appointed by the U.S. Attorney General. And Sujata, can I ask you uh, what provision should be included in, in protective orders? Uh, thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you to my fellow panelists, as well as the American Bar Association's section on civil rights and social justice for putting this panel together. I, I know you started off on protection orders, which is only one small facet of the larger issue of addressing the needs of survivors when we're looking at domestic violence in particular. I sort of want to backtrack a little bit to sort of uh, get to 
some of the points that uh, Bonita just sort of raised. And that goes back to the Violence Against Women Act. And it's kind of interesting being uh, representing the US when the US has never been part of any international law whatsoever, has never signed on to CEDA or, or any of those because we've always thought of ourselves as some sort of exclusionary um, country. Which is, problem, which is problematic uh, for many immigrant survivors that I have uh, worked with for a very, very long time. But I want to sort of get back to the passage of the Violence Against Women Act in 1996 and the decade of work before that, which is very critical as we're talking about the law. And I think uh, uh, Dr. Mayersfield just as sort of said that these two parallel paths now, the piece that was very critical in the Violence Against Women Act and then the National Protection Orders, all of that comes as a result of that, is the very close work that survivors, because it is essentially a survivor-led movement and survivors are absolutely critical and their voices and their experience should guide the work. And sometimes that's not what happens, but the Violence Against Women Act actually really showed how survivors, their advocates and attorneys and lawyers can work together to pass the Violence Against Women Act. Prior to that, of course, many states had different versions of protection, protective orders is one way of survivors getting a modicum of safety for a short amount of time. And since then, of course, it has evolved in many different ways and the Violence Against Women Act and its reauthorization after 1996. Right now, it's not, it hasn't been reauthorized. Uh, the House just passed it. It's sitting in the Senate. Um, and part of the ways in which the National Protection Order Registry has really worked is to allow people to get a protection order from a specific state and move to another state if necessary to flee from violence. It is often recognized that it is a piece of paper and it's a piece of paper as long as it's enforced and it's enforced across the board in ways that it was originally designed to do. It is, there is a lot of cynicism around uh, protection orders. Some uh, jurisdictions and some judges feel that at least the temporary order is given out like candy and people just get those protection orders. They're generally meaningless. And that later on, when you go in for a permanent order, it can create problems for some survivors because in certain states, permanent orders are permanent, permanent, which is it's permanent for a lifetime and doesn't have an expiry. The permanent order hearing then becomes a mini trial. And all of the stuff that was said just a few minutes ago that when people cannot give their story linearly, uh, going from point A to point B to point C, uh, sometimes survivors forget what it is that really happened, or it becomes a mini trial where the victim survivor is now put on trial, which was not the original intention of protection orders anyway. But the other piece that I think that's critical to sort of address as different players and actors and state actors all consider is that the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement, as well as the murder of black men and brown men has really forced many of us as survivors, as advocates, and sometimes as state actors to question how much should the state really intervene? How much is, what's the obligation of the state? What's the obligation when the state itself perpetrates violence? So do we go back to the community? It's often a very difficult issue for us because the problem is our communities are not that safe for survivors either. As many of us have to fight the community, we have to fight the state at the same time. So it's this conundrum that we are often put into, but there is a very serious questioning, definitely of going to law enforcement and prosecutors as offering, as, as state actors offering a way out for survivors. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Father. And now we have Tara Woodley, who's the president of the board of directors of Break the Silence Against Domestic Violence. She lost her 20-year-old daughter 
and her unborn granddaughter uh, uh, due to a brutal act of domestic violence that made national news. Tara also is a survivor. She describes the journey from victim to survivor and then the impact her story made on her history of the cycle of abuse within her family. This knowledge led her to found an organization in her child and grandchild's honor called the Ashley's Patience Project. Through the pain, Tara has fought courts and is working to raise awareness and change laws, not just across the nation, but worldwide. Tara travels the country as a national speaker and her role in activism has been recognized through the awarding of the Presidential Silver Service Award for Volunteerism and the President's Gold Service Award. I am going to unfortunately have to leave you now. I leave and Tara, you certainly can speak to your pain and also what your organization is doing and why many domestic violence survivors are afraid to report their uh, situation. And I leave it now to Ali to do all of the uh, questions and answers. And Ali, did you post the poll, Ali? I guess she's not there. Sure, uh, I'm happy to post the polls now. Okay, and unfortunately I have to leave you for medical reasons, but I cannot thank you enough on this very important issue. Thank you so much for your participation. Thanks, Ali, I leave it to you. All right. Oh, well, I'd, I'd like to thank you, Elizabeth, for having me on the Ellie, we are having problems hearing you. Um, I think it's it sounds like you're being eaten by the computer. Uh, so I'm not sure what's going on there. Hmm. I don't know if others are having the same problem. Yes, we are. Yeah, we can't. We can't understand what you're what you're saying, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, Tara, you're cutting. Yeah, you're cutting in and out. Like, you're cutting like in and said, out. I have started my advocacy work over the course of the last years after this. Yeah. Let me see if I. Okay, is that better? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, okay, good. Yeah, let me know. <laughs> but um, yes, I, I thank you all for allowing me to uh, you know, join this panel. I'm, I'm very blessed to have um, hear all of you speak today. I know in my advocacy work, like Elizabeth said, it started nine years ago to the loss of my daughter and my granddaughter. And it, within her own, you know, what happened within her own situation, how we used the system uh, exactly the way the system is supposed to be programmed for you to use, and yet she was still fell through the cracks and was killed. Um, so for me, shoring up that system and making sure that this system doesn't fail other women is a is a huge thing for me. Um, you know, victims so many times fear what. Um, it's going to happen when they go to get protective orders or to ask law enforcement um, what is what is going to happen to them, whether they're going to be believed, whether they they can get help. Um, our, our system here is not geared to even really address the fact that 
most of these crimes are considered misdemeanors instead of felonies. Um, most of these crimes are committed, you know, 80% of the time on women, it's lethal. Um, I have, through my advocacy work, tried to help promote um, lethality assessments, which I think are crucial for our judicial system and our law enforcement and first responders to perform these lethality assessments to help victims ascertain what kind of depths of really um, the extent of what they're looking at when they leave the situation. But I think it also helps provide these um, the legal system and first responders the exact same thing that they can evaluate the lethality that this particular victim is facing when she walks out the door. And um, the system's just not prepared for that. Um, I personally, you know, advocate and am very appalled by the fact that in this age of technology, that we are not technology savvy into helping our victims. Um, I know in our in the work I have done with legislatures and stuff, we have been able to promote things within um, the system that eight, 18 states have taken up things within call in a monitoring system because our shelters are so overloaded and they see the need for something like that and how it could be a positive change to um, have the accusers wear monitors um, so that the victims don't have to leave their whole home life or their situation. They can continue to work and to function. And of course, it's not something that is a 100% guarantee, but um, even within the states and the legislatures who have recognized to this, um, the, the legal system, the law enforcement, uh, DAs, they, they don't know that those laws are even in place that they can utilize, and they don't even know how to begin to utilize them. But the um, different counties throughout, at least here in America, have taken that up, and the counties who are using that kind of a system have an 80% drop in murder rates within their counties for women who are leaving. And so um, what I have been Others are having problems hearing you, Tara. Yeah, yeah. Tara, so you, Tara, you are we cutting are not out hearing again. you. Tara, you're cutting out again. Tara, Tara, you're cutting out. You are cutting out the last few minutes. We couldn't hear a thing. Um, well, it looks like Tara might have um, dropped off or um, experiencing some issues. Um, I, until we can get her back, I want to um, thank all of the panelists. Um, Ali, do you think she can call in sometimes? Do you know the video and stuff requires more bandwidth? Yeah. If she can call in. Uh oh. Okay. So while we, we work on getting Tara back, um, uh, I'd like to ask the other panelists if you have any, any thoughts or comments off of the, the other panelists' presentations. Hmm. Great, Dr. Simonovich. Thank you. Um, 
I would like to reflect on a few points uh, raised by uh, other panelists with respect to uh, domestic violence and rape also. If we look at uh, rape, um, when we are saying rape, who is thinking that rape is domestic violence? It could be. Rape could be domestic violence. If it is done within family or domestic unit or current or former spouses or partners. And um, we are having different categories. This is my point. So for example, now I am preparing new thematic report on rape as a crime at the national level, but also as a human rights violation, as a form of gender-based violence against women, but also as, as domestic violence. I'm not specifically mentioning domestic violence, but it is and could be domestic violence. And it is important what was mentioned uh, by Bonita that um, on many occasions today, if we look around the world, victims do not report rape or sexual violence. Uh, when they report, on only on few occasions we are seeing prosecution of perpetrators at the end. So there is a huge area of impunity in many states with respect to prosecution of rape at the national level. And um, in that report that I'm preparing, I have uh, looked into key issues with respect to, of, of, to criminalization of rape and international standards on rape and sexual violence, but we focus on rape because rape should be itemized, item, itemized. We have to see what are key elements for definition of rape, for scope of rape, for prosecution of rape. And there are so many things that should be considered. For example, if we look today at definitions of rape in different states, first we are seeing that there are definitions are different with respect to scope. Some definitions are covering women only. Majority of definitions are covering all possible victims. And this is trend that should be followed. Then if we look at um, coverage of uh, rape definitions with respect to marriage or spouses or intimate partners, in number of countries, there are exclusion clauses that exempt marital rape from prosecution of rape. So there are a number of such states, what means that in situation of domestic violence and marital rape, women are not protected or other partners are not protected. And this is clear problem with definitions that should be changed. Then if we look at age of sexual consent, age of sexual consent to define statutory rape is very different in different countries. And on that point, it is uh, really um, hard to, look into current uh, harmonization at the international level. But uh, somehow I think that uh, age of 16 could be used as, a, um, as age for sexual consent based on what I'm seeing around the world. But also definition of rape. In many states, criminal laws are defining rape with respect to use of force and coercion. And it is with such definition, Victims are then uh, in a situation during the criminal procedure process to prove this uh, uh, use of force and coercion. So this is changing. Istanbul Convention is now having new standard and is uh, clearly providing that sexual violence in rape and rape should be defined based on lack of consent as a center a part of definition of rape. So that means that lack, lack of consent should be uh, prescribed as a key element of definition of rape. And during um, judicial procedure, then a uh, burden of proof should be shifted from victim to perpetrator. And we have to see that there are uh, changes in number of European countries now. They have changed definition of rape. Then if we look at aggravated and mitigating circumstances, in many countries around the world, those mitigating circumstances are allow, allowing rapists to um, escape the punishment, to marry the victim. So there are things in, in such provisions that should be immediately changed. Then statute of limitations. In many states, there are very um, 
short periods in which victims could uh, uh, report rape and prosecution should be ex officio. In some states, it is, uh, it is on a private uh, uh, claim. So um, this statute of limitation is precluding in many states prosecution of rape. And it is also problematic for states in a conflict situation. For example, if, if there is uh, only uh, one year to uh, report uh, rape in order to be prosecuted, then it is a uh, too short period in, in many countries um, in which we have conflict and post-conflict situation, but also in, in peaceful situation. So there are different elements that should be looked with respect to rape and its prosecution. Prosecution is another segment. This victimization of uh, uh, those that report the rape during the process, uh, they uh, rape shield provisions that are not present in many states, protection of victims during the procedure and so on. And all of this, is resulting with impunity for perpetrators. So there is a lot of things that should be done at the national level with respect to legislation. We have somehow view that legislation is there, that criminal laws are criminalizing, criminalizing rape, but this is not sufficient. This is not in line with international standards in this area developed by um, international human rights law, but also we can mention also uh, ad hoc tribunals, ICC, International Court for Rwanda and former Yugoslavia that first started to look into definitions of rape because when they had those cases, there, there were no, at that time, we didn't have definition of rape at the international level. Now ICC provided also definition of rape, but there are also definitions of rape coming from jurisprudence of the CEDO committee work of uh, my mandate also that uh, that is focusing on rape and elements that should be there and currently the istanbul convention with this provision that is clearly saying that uh, rape should be defined uh, based on a lack of consent and not on a use of force solely as it is in many countries we are going in direction of really um, looking into a comprehensive set of elements that should be looked at it in each state in order to proceed in this level of uh, protection of uh, victims of rape and sexual violence. Thank you. Tara, you want to continue? You were cut off earlier. Tara, can you hear? Yes. Okay. Yes. Can you yes. hear me now? You, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. I'm not sure where I left off, <laughs> but um, I will try to continue. No, I think you were talking about lethality assessments and that, you know, what law enforcement can and cannot do and what, how that you kind of, it was right around that time that you got cut off. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, I think I was talking about in the age of technology, we can we can use this um, technology to help us protect the victims better. It seems like um, the um, uh, perpetrators have all the abilities in the age of technology to use it against victims instead of uh, us um, as you know a community and as law enforcement and our legal services being able to provide. Um, think ways that technology can help our victims. So um, that's a part of what, you know, in my advocacy work that um, the uh, counties within states that we've been able to facilitate um, this ankle monitoring system and they're using that in conjunction with shelters. Um, the lethality and murder rates have dropped 80% within those counties. And just getting um, our legal system to understand that that's available to them in 18 states, legislation has recognized it. And then trying to get it promoted, you know, statewide um, and then, you know, um, nationwide and see where we can broaden it from there. Um, I, I know that. Um, in addressing you know all of this and technology it means you know a, a short, it, i think it would help shore our, our system up um to where 
uh, victims don't have to be like right there in the middle of the system. The system works for them instead of them begging the system to protect them. The system can help work for them better. Um, if uh, the lethality assessments, you know, help in ways that not only um, Right now, we're just using them in a capacity to where victims can, um, you know, see what kind of situation they are. But you know, just advocating towards where the assessment can be turned over to the judge and into the court system and to the DA, and they can actually look at the situation from the basis of a lethality assessment as to what this victim is facing before they make decisions. Um, something that is more fact-based instead of just basing it off the emotion or basing it off of the, the victim having to, you know, maintain um, everything in their mind, in their order as to the facts of what happened. Like uh, some of the panelists said before, victims, when they are in that situation, they tend to block things out. But um, something that is fact-based like that could be used where judges could and the DAs and law enforcement can use it to actually help our victims get them out of situations. The states, there are several states using lethality now um, in the last nine years that I've been helping to promote it. And um, those states have significant numbers drop within their states on um, the rate of murder victims as well. So, um, you know, it's just worldwide, this is, you know, a, a, a situation because we're in America, but it's across the board and, and what can we do internationally? That's my next steps as to what we're looking at. What can we do internationally to promote that, um, to create, you know, laws internationally to help our victims um, using technology today? because that is the new form of where um, where uh, the perpetrators are using this against um, victims. And so, you know, even in cases like in, with my daughter, that's how he used technology and he used the protective order system in order to hunt her down. And I had no clue until I started advocating for women that that's that runs across the board, across the gamut. The um, protective orders, women having to just go in and seek a protective order um, puts her at risk of her perpetrator finding her when she's trying to be in hiding. And um, for the system to fail women in that capacity or fail you know, any victim, in that capacity to where going to court to do a protective order or renew an emergency protective order um, shouldn't be a death sentence. And it is across this country. So um, I I guess that's pretty much what I was, <laughs> considering I was cut off, I kind of lost track of what I was saying, but yeah. And I thank you for listening. Thank you, Tara, so much for sharing your pain and, uh, you know, the challenges and sort of living with it, but trying to use your experience to make life better for others so that we, you know, uh, other survivors can figure out ways to get out of the situation and um, with their children too, because you lost your granddaughter also. But thank you so yes. much for sharing. Uh, in yes, fact, there you. is a question uh, in the Q&A around uh, the, uh, to speak to the, to violence against children, both physical and sexual. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, the person who asked that question, I, I think the reason we were not considering it is because the system in the US that deals with children, uh, whether that be uh, direct child abuse, physical or sexual, is a different system altogether than that that deals with sort of um, young adult survivors as well as adult survivors of 
domestic and sexual violence. The two systems don't often cooperate and sometimes are actually in opposition to each other because one system sees the children as the focal point and the other system sees the adult survivor as the uh, focal point with children being exposed to violence. And those of us who have worked with those systems find it challenging at best. So I think you have to look at whether it's the child who's being exposed or the child, the direct, the direct victim. And that kind of makes it quite complicated. I think Dr. Myersfield was talking about how complicated systems are. And I think when you bring children in, it just completely messes up. And then when you're looking at issues in civil court, um, such as uh, custody, visitation, all of that is just, what's the best word to use? Is a mess is the best way I can say it to you. I don't think there's any other way to convey, you know, there are cases of severe violence. Judges have been known to give custody or at least 50-50 parenting for um, abusers, which now keeps the survivor in constant contact with the abuser. So uh, in the short time we have, that's the easiest way for me to address it, at least in the context of the US. But Tara can speak to it and either uh, anyone else can also speak to how the systems work in other parts of the world. And I'll keep quiet. So. Yes, yes. And um, yeah, here the system definitely separates the two. And that's part of what I have worked really hard against is that this is one issue when it comes to child custody and your um with with the victim because they are victims themselves just having to watch it they are victims themselves and they're and and the system fails to recognize that and um so trying to get the system to combine the two and recognize it as one is a huge failure failure within our system um this system literally like protective orders across all 50 states can include your pets but you can't include your children and to me that is you know a huge gap in our system that needs to be corrected um if the children are so used against um the victim as they're trying to leave they are used as weapons even if they haven't endured anything physical they have the emotional trauma from it so you know trying to move forward and get courts to recognize that um, it can it can start in little ways some across the country there's been a movement more of um in a lot of states where in particular with my case with my daughter um they did charge with a felony because she was pregnant but it was only a felony because she was pregnant so they did recognize the child in that case and then that state would after that you know nothing would have been done so um i think it's getting you know uh the getting the talk out there you know of how, how it really does affect our system and these two these two systems combining because they do not talk with one another whatsoever um it it's almost like they um it, it's kind of like what was described earlier about that highway of them being opposite directions in each other uh, it it, it happens to be that way as far as women and their children or you know families and their children when they're trying to um, deal with the system when it's court case of uh, child custody involved. So if anybody else wants to add anything. I think both uh, both of you have your uh, hands up. One of you can just go. I'm just facilitating since uh, Elizabeth left us. That's all. Dr. Samanovic, you go first, yeah, please. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I would like to add that um, I am really appreciating uh, what Tara said with respect to um, fatality risk assessment. I'm very sorry for your loss, Tara, but uh, it is encouraging to see that uh, in uh, 
18 US states now, there is this fatality risk assessment. And here it is important to see that this is also standard now in Istanbul Convention, because risk assessment, lethality risk assessment is required in cases uh, when there is a situation of violence against women. So this risk assessment is now uh, something that many states are developing and um, we can have a full conference on this to see what are key elements and so on. But it is good that we are seeing good results when this is uh, as a new tool applied at the national level. Uh, then uh, what was said by uh, Suyata on a uh, mess between uh, um, framework with respect to women and uh, domestic violence and uh, children's rights. We are seeing all over the world this problem with custody rights of children. And here I would like to flag out again, uh, Istanbul Convention and standard that we have there. Uh, and that was debated also during the elaboration of the Istanbul Convention. And there is now clear reference that uh, um, violence against women should be taken into consideration by judges when they are discussing and deciding into child custody cases. And this is not happening in many states. Judges are still allowing, allowing custody rights to perpetrators in spite of everything. And then with respect to protection Orders, protection orders are um, in, in 10 states that I have visited. I could not say that they are really efficient because uh, uh, there is a, this time lag between issuance of, of order and really enforcement of order. And then in many states, there are double protection orders one for victim, the other for perpetrator. And then we are losing the sense who is the victim and who is the perpetrator. And some of protection orders, again, are not covering, uh, let's say children, what is also a problem in some situations. So the point is there is a mess, but there are standards that are emerging now. They should be used. They should be uh, used to harmonize national laws with new standards that we have developed at international level. Thank you. Just following on that point and, and also in response well, to everybody, but to Tara's um, situation and very, very brave and admirable and deeply appreciated interventions that you've made, not only on this um, seminar, but in general. I think we're starting to see a shift from broad abstract concepts down to narrow drill down detail. And long ago, it's, uh, it's, it's been said that the state, the criminal justice system, the infrastructure around policing, all of that is catered around the public, around men, around concerns that affect, influence and target men, and that we are fighting this battle in large part, not only, but in large part, because we're stuck with systems and structures and approaches and laws and rules of evidence that are so fundamentally non-applicable and inappropriate for the type of harm we're considering. And some of the examples that have come out, right, the, the, the issue of prosecution. And in South Africa, we find that uh, in a recent study in which I was in, there, uh, in which I participated, we found that 8% of reported rapes, 8% of reported rapes ultimately made their way to prosecution. And we know the reasons for that, right? We know prosecutorial discretion, we know that prosecutors want to show a win, so they take the cases that exacerbate the perception that uh, Dr. Simonovich was talking about, right? That it's a force, that it's violent. And so we know that that's in fact only a part of the phenomenon of rape, that really the, the silent rape, the fright, the freezing, that all of those things are crimes and manifestations of rape, but prosecutors won't prosecute them because the rules of evidence are such that we're looking for something beyond a reasonable doubt, should you be doing reverse onus of proof. And the same, I think, you know, if you were to compare 
the legal and state and institutional responses to gender-based violence on the one hand, with, for example, responses in the United States to terrorism or to financial fraud or to treason. You, you would find the most remarkable complexity of detailed laws, financial commitment, specificity in responses to the latter. But the former is completely abstract and relies on people who are paid a measly amount of money at court levels that are ultimately very alienating and, and deficient often in terms of the agents populating those courts from judges to lawyers, where it's actually, and we know the story, it's easier to let it go than it is to pursue justice. Can, uh, can I just add, uh, oh, hi Rose, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, I'm very touched by uh, what uh, Tara said and uh, it's really heartbreaking. Um, uh, my point is, um, I think we need much more skills, capacity, but also resources around really uh, uh, establishing evidence, but also uh, linking it to protection of witnesses. Uh, what you are meeting here in, uh, uh, in the community is a very deep silence when the perpetrator, for example, has kind of power in the community and around him, there is a kind of complicity, there is a kind of, but which is prompted by fear, not because people do approve, but because around him, there is a kind of, uh, of fear because he has some kind of economic, political or social power that they, they, they might fear. And they don't trust the protection that the witness uh, uh, can have. And this, I think, is, is one of the, the challenging situation that when you are campaigning and asking people to speak out and to disclose what is happening, especially in uh, at uh, the domestic level, and when you can't build a kind of shield to really protect the witnesses and encourage them to come forward, uh, this is, is something that is going to not allow very proper uh, prosecution if it is not addressed and if resources are not uh, provided. Uh, I think it is something that we should look at very carefully if we want to, to address uh, the issues. Uh, there is a question here uh, from uh, Donna w uh, Wickes that, you know, she uh, says, Tara, so sorry for your loss. Is there any framework going forward to change the antiquated system to have them work as a unit? Anybody can take it. So if Why you, you to go ahead, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yes, well, you know, I, I was listening to all of you and just thinking about what's happening in the US right now, right? And I think um, the systems are antiquated, but I will also say that 40 years of survivors pushing at the system to change has led to changes. There, there's no doubt in, the, doubt in my mind about that. And I've worked in other countries where it's really survivors and advocates that have pushed for change. So change has happened. And I think we have to um, sort of recognize that. But systems are systems. They are monoliths. They take time. You have to push against it. You have to push against your community. As Rose was saying, you know, you have a powerful guy in the community. That's the end of it. Communities don't necessarily operate that way, but it is really us working together. I think the sort of American Old West Lone Ranger, you know, I'll do the work myself does not work. It's how people collaborate, how people work together, and it's really constant pushing. You know, people have a few successes and think they've done a great job. No, it's not, because the number of women falling through the crack as Tara's 
daughter and granddaughter, you know, and Tara herself has experienced, there are lots of survivors who fall through the crack, especially if you are poor in the US, if you're from a community of color, if you're an immigrant, you know, you just have to figure out alternate ways of trying to uh, make sure that you're safe and your kids are safe. That anybody else can say, I should just keep quiet. Well, great. Um, so we're approaching the end of the webinar and I want to offer each panelist uh, the opportunity to offer any final thoughts. Um, and so we'll start um, in the order that we presented. So Dr. Samanovich. I would like to thank all panelists for their inputs and for this rich discussion. And I think that uh, we are seeing uh, progress that is slow, that is uneven, and that requires many changes at uh, international, but also regional and national level. In uh, my reports, I have suggested a number of changes. I am not uh, going to go into details, but uh, from uh, my perspective, I think that uh, at the global level, at the UN level, we also need to uh, upgrade violence against women and domestic violence higher at the UN agenda. And recently I have proposed that Commission on the Status of Women should address violence against women each year, not only from time to time every four years, because each year we have to track the progress in different states all over the world. Also, we have to connect violence against women with uh, discrimination against women. We also have to see how international law has expanded in different areas related to laws and their implementation and here it is important to see that uh, in many states there is perception when there is domestic violence law then law is there or when there is criminalization of rape the job is done but now it is more and more uh, visible and clear that we need other provisions like risk assessment like efficient protection orders like uh, um, uh, all those things that are new now in Istanbul Convention and that are also covered by CEDO Convention, but in a general manner that are also having a framework in Beijing Platform for Action, Declaration on the Elimination of Violence Against Women and so on, but should be now really turned into realities. And here, in addition to what we have discussed, the uh, relevance of data, comparable data, comparable data on femicides or intentional killings of women is needed in order to see which countries are really uh, preventing violence and femicides against women if cases are going down or if cases are not going down. I have proposed establishment of femicide watches or national bodies that would look into cases of intentional killings of women, femicides, intimate partner killings and family related killings and countries that have started this process that are looking into cases because we should not wait case to go to judiciary to have it before international CEDO committee or European Court for Human, Human Rights, African Court or Inter-American Court because it is important, of course, but it takes a number of years. At the national level, we can have a group of independent experts that, that can look in all cases of killing of women throughout the year at the level of a province or state and so on, and see what are those patterns, what are similarities, what are key issues. And in many occasions, there is a problem with police force or with prosecution, or there are, there are problems that could be detected. And then recommendations should go in direction of changes that are needed at the national level. I think that this discussion is very important. I'm glad that I have participated in this webinar. And each time I'm, le I'm learning something, so I have learned something from all of you. And thank you for inviting me. Can they come in? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. First, thank you so much for your organizers of uh, this uh, the, the discussion. 
Um, my, my last point, I, I want just to echo, um, I don't remember who talked about technology. Uh, I think it is time, this is the time to use technology being in um, evidence researching and in many other aspects uh, in, um, when it comes to violence against women. Uh, and the technology that are affordable, that are accessible, uh, you know, domestic violence and crimes are becoming much more sophisticated these days. Sometimes it is really becoming very, very scientific. It is very critical that the victims are able to, to, to defend themselves and uh, to, to, to get the, the, the means that are necessary. Uh, I think we need more now thought on it how can we innovate in poor communities, in, 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 in remote communities? How do we ensure that they have uh, the technology? Yeah, I want to give just a, a very small example of what we, we went through during the, the, the lockdown, during the COVID. The fact that we have a, a free hotline made it possible that we could know as much as possible that can to know what was happening in the homes. But imagine if we don't have that technology. But there are so many other technology innovation that we can put in place to think about so that really investigation, prosecutions, and and, uh, and bringing really um, uh, perpetrators to, to, to account. I, I think we have not deployed all our efforts to ensure that really uh, women are protected. There's still a room of doing much. Thank you so much. I was very, um, uh, Pleased to see all of you. Hope we stay in contact. One of the key gaps that I think continues to prevent the success of the endeavors, the ideas, the interventions is the profound lack of accountability on the part of those who are supposed to actually enforce and implement the laws. And I, I always compare this to having a child. If you have a child and you tell your child to clean up after themselves, and you can tell them as many times as you want, clean up after yourself. And if the child ignores you and you can Say it as many times as you want. In this home, we clean up after ourselves. You must clean up after yourself. But really, it's only when there are consequences that behavior starts to change. And it's only when some treat or, or advantage is taken away from the child that they understand that the imperative of cleaning up that the language, that the rule is in fact one that must be obeyed. What we see in South Africa in particular, but it's global, it's worldwide, is that the system fails when the police officer refuses to believe or tells the complainant to go home and sort things out with her husband. The system fails when the doctors refuse to produce proper reports uh, medical reports on rape because they just don't want to spend the time in court testifying when that matter eventually goes to trial. The system fails when officers at court refuse to open cases or allow complainants to see magistrates and justices. The system fails when prosecutors refuse to prosecute or even when they decide to prosecute when they aren't actually allowed to submit evidence that is appropriate or where inappropriate evidence is submitted and nothing is done about it because the prosecutors and the judges are not capable of doing it. And the system fails when punishment is imposed that takes into account the fact that the rapist of the child was an uncle and therefore the imprisonment must be reduced because the person was known to the victim. You know, and the, the, the failure of the system is perpetuated time and again because all of those who are the agents of failure remain unaccountable, unaddressed, and these should be the biggest violations 
And until we see that change in accountability, then I think that we're not going to be cleaning up after ourselves. Thank you to everybody who joined me uh, in, on the panel and to the ABA. And uh, definitely we miss uh, Elizabeth and hope all is well with her. And thank you to all the participants who joined us. Um, and I know you had some questions. We try to answer them as much as we could. I, I think that all the laws, all what everybody has said so far, I share, um, you know, since we all work in the same area, but I would also say that the state, um, however you define the state, needs to put money where their mouth is. I think they do not put money. You know, you can pass all the laws you want, but if there isn't money and money that is there for a good solid 20 to 30 years to really bring about change, you know, it will be piecemeal. There is a lot of money given the sheer amounts of wealth that is concentrated in the hands of a few. Higher taxes would go a long way in making sure we end gender-based violence. And I'll turn it over to Tara. Tara disappeared, Tara. Ali, I'm not sure what happened to Tara. So and I, I, yeah. Um, well, uh, yes, it looks like um, she must have gotten disconnected, but um, I want to thank everyone for joining us for this free webinar. Um, and it's now time to conclude. Um, we'd also like to express our gratitude to this esteemed group of panelists who are all doing such critical work and we thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to share your experiences. The section of civil rights and social justice provides free webinars and resources for legal professionals and advocates nationwide. We hope this helps you in your work. And again, if you can, please consider joining and becoming active in the ABA. You may do so at AmericanBar.org backslash CRSJ. Best of luck in your work and stay safe, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.